This is my Jon Snow look, <laughs> by the way, when my hair is just right. Okay, we've got a slide. So at the dawn of the 21st century, uh, I was dissatisfied with my home country. The U.S. did not fit my values, and the customer service was terrible. Like, I just wanted like a Vodafone kind of level, and it wasn't even close. So I thought, maybe I'm in the wrong country. I looked around the world, and really, places weren't much better. So I was like, there's something really strange about this government industry, that it's the largest sector in the global economy, but the biggest company posts like staggering losses year after year, and the worst companies, horror. And so that was the puzzle in the early 2000s. Most industries are constantly innovating and improving, but most governments are barely innovating, and they sometimes even go backwards. So a lot of people look at government through the lens of, um, is it moral or does it represent me? And I take a different view. I say drop that and just look at government as an industry. So what do we see? First, the firms are massive, and we know what that means for innovation. And second, the barrier to entry is not just high, it's like undefined. You're like dereferencing a null pointer. Like there's not a process that's known. And then the cost of switching providers, like moving between countries, is really high. Getting lower year after year, but still really high. And so from this angle, this kind of cuts through all of these other views and just says, we have an industry that's a cartel of huge companies that have local monopolies and high customer lock-in. Like, of course there's shitty service. Of course there's no innovation. Like, the problem is not philosophical, it's structural. And this view also suggests an answer, right? We've got this legacy industry doing a crappy job, how do we fix it? With startups, with competition. So, you know, now I'd reduce this problem of finding a home country for myself to something simple. We just have to change the world so that people can create new jurisdictions, they can create cities and countries, like they start companies today. Simple, right? I mean, not easy, but simple. So my first iteration was seasteading. The idea was that by building communities on the ocean, we'd open a new frontier where we could create new societies, new jurisdictions. Then the barrier to entry might be as low as a cruise ship. Not because the high seas are lawless. I'm so tired of that. That's not how it works. It actually works in a really cool way, where each ship registers with a country, flies their flag, and it's under their jurisdiction, almost like a floating embassy. The country is franchising their sovereignty to the vessel, like, which is amazing. It's very network statey, and because it's a virtual association, in order to have some level of autonomy, you just have to find one country anywhere in the world that's willing to create a custom flag for you, that wants to serve this new market. So I wrote a book on seasteading in 2004 um, with, little, with Perl scripts so you could comment on every, on every paragraph. Uh, and then in 2007, Peter Thiel funded me to start the first competitive governance nonprofit, the Seasteading Institute. And we reached millions of people with the idea of building new societies, um, including some of the audience and speakers here today. And we got the message out so well that we were even mark, mocked by talk shows, which like now I wear as this total badge of honor. A haven as connected to land as libertarians are to reality. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, he wasn't all wrong. Um, after starting the Institute, my partner and I running it knew that we needed more than a nonprofit and some renderings. We needed to build. So we, in 2011, we started working on a medical tourism cruise ship company, which we thought was promising. But now let's go back. Meanwhile, Dubai pioneered the modern zone in 2004. They wanted to create a financial center, and they knew that their homegrown Sharia law was not a good supportive tech for that product. Now, laws, most people don't realize that law is open source, meaning it's published freely, it's available, it's copyable. So Dubai forked London's code base. They copied it and modified it for their own uses, leaving it in English with the rest of their laws in Arabic. 
And they even created their own courts and brought in uh, UK judges who were experienced with this code base. Then in 2009, economist Paul Romer, now a Nobel laureate, brought his take on the idea and his analysis of why expanding the traditional idea of zones to become charter cities would be an incredible tool for development. Many technical details to be worked out, but those of us who are already starting to pursue these things can already tell that there's no roadblock, there's no impediment other than a failure of imagination. Like Dubai, Romer's zones would set their own commercial law, but in his model, uh, rather than being set up and run by the country, as Dubai did, it was set up and run by some uh, guarantor nation that had good laws and high investor trust. A brilliant group in Honduras saw the potential of this idea, and they, they created the first real-world program. Unlike Romer's concept, these zones would be developed in a public-private partnership with a company working with Honduras as the host country. I heard about this in 2011 and was like, holy crap, like, wow, like, this, this stuff is real. We can like, create a new jurisdiction on land where things are easier to build. And so my co-founder and I pivoted to charter cities uh, after a year of work and the world's first MOU for a charter city with Honduras. We realized in 2012 that we were just too early. Like Honduras had changed their constitution, but they didn't have any budget yet. Like this was like a Google 20% project, like kind of nights and weekends, like side hustle. And so, you know, it was not gonna happen soon. We figured it would take years for them to get this program. And so, you know, we wound things up and did other things. In the years after that, starting in 2012 to 2017, Bitcoin started showering wealth on people who were highly, highly value aligned. And this has actually turned out to be critical. In my fund, uh, the majority of investment dollars comes from crypto. So really important enabler. Then in 2017, the Zeta program gave initial approval to Honduras Prospera, which you've seen and heard about here. And like after 15 years, a startup city was finally happening. So. I saw this as it's gotten real, you know? We're going from dreamers to doers. This is actually happening. There's gonna be a whole new industry around these ideas. So I started work on Pronomas Capital, which is the first charter city investment fund. We closed in 2019 with some incredible backers, including the visionary who brought all of us here together today. And we fund companies that are actually building. Like, I love that I finally get to show videos of like dirt like real dirt, like dirt is exciting. Dirt is not a rendering. Dirt is not an idea or a metaphor. Dirt is real. Um, and you've heard about Prospera and Praxis, so I'll show you a few others. When I close my eyes, sometimes I imagine a magical sunset against the silhouette of greenhouse full of fresh fruits and a light cool breeze against a sparkling pond full of tilapia. I imagine my son playing in green grass and my family sitting down to a healthy meal in a home I can call my own, in a community I helped to build. So that's small farm cities, which is turning empty land in Africa into profitable farming villages with microgrid infrastructure and affordable housing. Now, Etana in Nigeria has been approved for the first digital free zone in Africa, maybe in the world. This is like a new type of special economic zone that adds incorporation, banking, and other features. And they're building a district for builders where 3,000 people will enjoy co-living, co-working, restaurants, and nature within the 150 square kilometer Lekki free zone, which includes the largest refinery in Africa. Real dirt. And in Palau, our company Metropolis just got the green light from the President, Senate, and Congress, shout out to Elaine over there, to create an offshore corporate registry where you can incorporate with the laws of Delaware or Singapore or Taiwan. Remember, laws are open source. There's nothing to stop a country from importing the laws and precedents of another country like a software library. So you'll be able to incorporate offshore with standard documents or port an existing company to Palau, like moving data centers, keeping all of your documents. And this is so real that this week, I am going to prosper to get my genes edited. 
with a treatment only available there. Like, that is real. Really, really real. So join us if you want to learn more. You can find my podcasts and interviews. Follow us on our socials, Portfolio Socials, and my DMs are open.